again. We're still talking about this fellow named Umar. We're still moving and trying to unpack the, the Jerusalem thesis or whatever name you want to call it. We've listened to Paul. We've also listened to Mel. Now we want to go and listen to Joe. Joe is another one that has really, really helped us understand the Jewish antecedents to what then later became Islam. And Joe, because of his Jewish background, brings a whole different narrative that none of us, at least I've not heard it before, and most of what you have seen so far on my Fander films has not really has not really dealt with this side, this category. Glimpses. glimpses. This glimpse. Glim Thank you. There's yeah. Joe already. He's there. And you, he doesn't show his face. You're not going to see who he is. I'm not going to say too much about him. Although I will say Joe has a great YouTube site. It's called Red Judaism. Uh, on, back, uh, if you look at the comments below, the whole box, the description box, we're going to put his YouTube uh URL there so you can go look and see what he's doing because he comes from a completely different tangent a completely different historical background the Jewish background which we really haven't said much about and we need to hear that side of it so Joe you're there I heard you come in just a little bit God bless you for joining us thanks for coming on board go Thank ahead and what I would like Jay. to do Joe is to give us a, a whole nother narrative show us what we are missing what we haven't said found so far because one of the things we have said and one of the things i will always keep reminding me people anybody who comes on my show i don't want you to just repeat what's in the ninth and tenth century traditions the standard islamic narrative i don't care about that anymore i want to see how islam began from the seventh century but in order to understand the seventh century we're going to have to go even before that and you have a you have a great background, uh, your Jewish background, because of the fact you're reading in that area, you understand it, you understand the whole paradigm, uh, the whole Sadducee, Sadducee paradigm. I want you to help us walk us through and show us what we're missing so that we can see get a bigger, better knowledge of what then became Islam after the seventh century. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for the introduction. So um, I think probably be a good idea for people to go away and get a cup of tea, come back and sit down and have a listen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, it's a Jewish history, which was happening, something which was happening in the seventh century. Um, let's, let's just explore the Jewish story. And while we're exploring the Jewish story, I think you're going to find a lot of um, sort of uh, pennies dropping. The penny is going to drop. Um, on a lot of things, you say, hold on a second, that's, that's Islam, and that's Islam, that's Islam, that's Islam, it's Islam. But to, to get there, we have to, we have to go to approach it the way I approached it. I mean, I approached Islam only because I was interested in Jewish history in the seventh century. So I was studying Jewish history in the seventh century, and I came across, I was looking for artifacts and anything, sources which were going to give me more information about the story of Judaism or Judaisms in the seventh century. And uh, I wasn't convinced that the sources which were appearing, which are claimed by um, the Islam, Islam claims these artifacts and sources, I wasn't convinced that they, that they belonged to Islam. I think, no, they seem to me to be belonging to uh, Judaic uh, groups, Judaic religions and movements. And this is why. So starting with, um, in the beginning of the seventh century, there was a, emperor, a Byzantine emperor called Phocas. Phocas um, decided that he would force all the Jews in his empire to convert to Christianity. And that caused a mass migration of Jews out of Byzantium, Byzantine territories, and they went and sought refuge in Persia. They didn't have much else, to, well, <laughs> much options really, um, although many did go down to Ethiopia as well. But it was basically Persia or, or nowhere, nowhere else, really. Um, and uh, very interesting groups of Jews also who were worshipping in synagogues, which were built just in the 6th century. For example, Beit Alpha Synagogue, which is a Messianic Jewish synagogue, or Messianic Hebrew synagogue, we can at least call it. And these Messianic Hebrew synagogues had been existing, I mean, there's one in... Um, uh, in Tiberias, there's one in Beit Sherim, and there's this one in Beit Alpha, which was built in the 6th century. And these Messianic Hebrews were 
praying in synagogues. They were using Jewish practices, but their synagogues have decorations with um, images of the Messiah in them. Quite different from uh, Christian churches, but they were forced to convert to Christianity or, or leave. And so they left and they went to Persia. Now, about the same time in Persia, we have an emperor, Khosrau II. Khosrau II um, uh, has a disagreement with the leader of the Jews uh, in, uh, in the Persian Empire and has him executed. And in his place, he appoints somebody called Nehemiah ben Hushiel. Um, now, the exilarch, just so you do, in case you know, the exilarch of the Jews means the, the leader of the Jews in exile. That's called the exilarch. And he, he lived in Persia, but he gets uh, executed by Khosrau II and is replaced by Nehemiah ben Hushiel, who is a Sadducee Karite. It's a kind of uh, Jew, Jewish movement, but they are very different from uh, what you know as Orthodox Jews or even Reform Jews is a completely different uh, movement. See, Reform Judaism and Orthodox Judaism is based on the Mishnah, which means um, the uh, sort of cultural context of how we understand the Torah. For example, the Mishnah tells us that we have one man, one woman in, the wife, in a marriage. Marriage is one man, one woman. That's a marriage. And the Mishnah tells us this. Um, but... Uh, if you were to read the Bible without the Mishnah, I'm talking about the Old Testament, not the New Testament. If you read the Tanakh without the Mishnah, you'd think that it was permissible to have as many wives as you like. Um, but the Mishnah says, no, that's not how it is. We interpret things differently. Uh, Mishnah also, for example, gives us, makes it clear that, yes, you can do things like uh, taking your sheep out of a ditch on Shabbat, whereas... Um, uh, a straightforward, simple, literal reading of the Tanakh would give the impression that was uh, impossible to do. So Mishnah gives uh, sort of, what we can say, um, gives the, 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 the kindness, the kinder side of Judaism, the kinder side of Judaism, which people are generally unaware of because they only read the Bible without the Mishnah and they think that Judaism must be a very harsh religion from the Old Testament, so they don't, they don't have a correct understanding of Judaism, which is much more well, gentle. Joe, could we say then that these Sadducees are really the, um, they're the radical, they're the radical. They Jews. are radical. They're radical, literal, uh, literal Old Testament text, no, neither add to nor take away any of the words of the Old Testament text, but that they don't have any interpretation there's no gentle interpretation of it. It's what it says, that's what you do. It says, go and kill all the Canaanites, burn down all their cities, you know, burn the trees, kill the children, kill the animals. That's what you do. There's no... The literalists is what you're Very saying. literal, yes, the literalists. So the Sadducees and the Karaites are literalists. They're, they're literalists. And that's why in modern Judaism, we don't consider them to be Jews, but they are a, a, a Judaic movement. Anyway, the point is Nehemiah ben Hushiel gets appointed as the leader of the Jews, which you can imagine is a bit of a problem in, 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 uh, in the Persian Empire. So what happens in uh, 610? Uh, on the 3rd of March in the year 610 AD at 7.30 p.m., there was an interesting event which can be interpreted by the... Um, the, the Persian sort of ast astrologers as a good omen for war, time for war, time for Sasan to go to war. And because they were pagans, you, you have to understand that's they, they took signs from the stars like that. So what this is, what we see here is, is a picture of what the, the this is uh, generated from computer program of what this, what the moon looked like. There's a thin crescent of a moon you can see coming along here. This is a thin crescent of the moon. You could see this at 7.30 p.m. from Kufa. If you were looking, um, I believe if you're looking towards the west from Kufa, you would see this, this thin crescent of the moon. And what happened was this little white dot here, this is the planet Mars, which was behind the moon. And the, 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 the new moon is, although it's it looks like there's nothing there, it's actually a it's actually a, a, a big disc. It's just, there's no light shining on it, isn't there? There's a big, there's a sort of disc there. There's no light shining on it. So that M Mars is invisible when it's behind the disc, even though there's no light shining on it. And then Mars appears 
at the corner of the crescent here from behind the moon, and it looks like a kind of a teardrop welling up at the corner of this eye and then dropping off as time goes, as, 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 the, as the minutes pass by, Mars sort of pops out from behind the back of the moon. And that uh, is interpreted as Mars coming from Sasan. Sasan, Sasani and Aram, their symbol was the crescent moon. So Mars is the symbol of war. So war comes from the crescent moon. It's like, oh, it's a good omen. It's a good time to go to war. So they took that as a good, o good omen, I'm suggesting. And this, I think, is important for later because I think the, 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 the Arabs interpreted this as the moon splitting. It looks like a little piece of the moon dropping off because they didn't understand it. Um, but actually, what was actually happening is, is that the, uh, the planet Mars was emerging from behind the crescent moon. It's called an occultation or a deoccultation of Mars. Occultation means hiding. So there was a deoccultation of Mars from behind the crescent moon at 7.30 p.m. on the 3rd of March in 610 AD. And you can all go and check that up if you, in your own software if you have some retro calculation software for looking at the stars and things like that. And uh, so that's, that was an interesting event. What happens after that is indeed Sasan does go to war. Uh, they go to war against Phocas. And they use this Nehemiah ben Hushiel, who was the, the new leader, this Sadducee leader of the, the Jews who replaced the Exilarch, to lead the army of Jews, who they used as basically their footmen, sort of like a vanguard, expendable forces, to go ahead of the Persians and uh, uh, conquer the, the Romans. So they sort of used this as cannon fodder, if you like. Um, so they sent the Jews in, and under Nehemiah ben Hushiel, though, it was, it was actually quite a bloody conquest. They fought like mad. They fought for their lives, but they also fought for their land because they were invading Jerusalem. They were invading the Holy Land. And you have to understand from, it doesn't matter what kind of sect of Jews you are, whether you're, um, whether you're Karite Jews or Sadducee Jews or regular Jews, um, the Holy Land is the Holy Land. It's, it's our land. So they were fighting for their land, and they went in there, and it was a massacre. They killed, hun uh, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of Christians were killed uh, and they actually conquered the Holy Land for Khosrau the, the second. And so that's, um, that's what happened. So um, there you see a map of how the Persians uh, expanded into the Byzantine territory and conquered the Holy Land. So Nehemiah ben Hushiel and his followers were very happy at this point. Um, they had taken over the Holy Land. And Nehemiah and his followers established something called the Council of the Righteous in Jerusalem and immediately started clearing the Temple Mount, which was prohibited for prayer by the Christians. Um, uh, the, the, the exact dome where the Dome of the Rock is now, that stone underneath was prohibited for as a place of worship for Christians. But uh, the, the, uh, the Jews under Nehemiah ben Hushiel set about trying to clear the Temple Mount and establish their Council of the Righteous, that's called a Ma'amed, not Muhammad, it's just a Hebrew word, Ma'amed, in, it's also pronounced in Sephardic pronunciation, it's called Muhammad, sorry. Um, and that actually means a council, a, a ruling council of the Jews. So they established themselves in, uh, in Jerusalem. But then what seems to happen is that Khosrau uh, the second declares himself to be the greatest of gods. And you may uh, know, if you're familiar with the history of the Jews, that we don't react very well when a leader starts declaring himself uh, God and demands that we accept or recognize him as God. So you can imagine that Nehemiah ben Hushiel, being a very strict uh, literalist with regards to the Bible, wasn't going to have any of that and uh, objected to um, the, we understand, this is not written, but we understand obviously, contextually, he clearly objected to the idea of Khosrau II being uh, the greatest god, and that's Yazadta, and um, he uh, and his people became, uh, what can we say, persona non grata, or personae non, e non grata, from, from Khosrau's point of view. They were, the, they were suddenly very, uh, he wanted to get rid of them. So he, he exiled them from the Holy Land, from the Temple Mount, and the Holy Land as, as a whole, and the Jews were exiled, and they went, and they, according to Sabios, they went and barricaded themselves up in Edessa. 
and that was around the year, probably around the way, year 617, 618, they, they, they went and barricaded themselves up in Edessa. So I've just described to you the story of what was happening in the West. So there was a, a successful conquest of the Holy Land, followed by a, an exile uh, just a few years later, and the Jews had to get out and barricade themselves up in Edessa. So now, meanwhile, there was a movement happening in the East. Joe, there can I just interrupt real quickly here? All of this history that you've done so far comes yes. from what sources? These are from Jewish sources, from Karite sources, Karite sources themselves. Kirkasani. Now you're moving. Now you're going to move into Kabbali, well, so you're now moved to 10th century Islamic sources. Well, Push Shariati has written a lot about this, but yes, to just give a picture of where what things are happening, what's what starts to be happening. Uh, meanwhile, in the East, I just need to give a little bit of a kind of a background of what was happening in the East. So in the East, meanwhile, in Hira, you know the story we've heard from, or, and the most sort of comprehensive discussion of what was happening in his sources is Tabari, who is an Abbasid source, and so therefore we can't necessarily trust everything that he's saying. It's going to be influenced by an Abbasid, Abbasid agenda. Uh, the Abbasid agenda clearly is that... Sorry? Just so, uh, just so people are aware where you're getting where you're getting this now this next material where it's coming from so tabari mainly from mainly from tabari and the opposite agenda of course is that islam began miraculously with a prophet and miraculous conquests they play down a lot something which is discussed in tabari called the battle of the car it's it's almost invisible in the islamic histories everything else is much more important than this but from Pur Shariati and other sort of secular scholars have uh, suggested that this is actually the most important battle there was, because if you take the religion or the, the, the religious narrative out of the story, what we have is that the first battle of independence against the Persians among the Arabs. That's what it's actually describing, which is about the same time that we're talking about the start of the, the year of the Arabs, remember. We know that there is a year of the Arabs which begins. Just the thing is, nobody can agree on what the year of the Arabs was. And sometimes there's... You're, re you're referring to 622, the year that's of the right. Arabs. Yeah. Okay. And there's sometimes... And there's... 622 is still, is still considered, that's the year for the Hijrah, according yeah. to the standard Islamic according narrative. According to the Islamic narrative, that's right. But then there are slightly different uh, opinions on when that might have been exactly, because we have some sources suggesting that something was happening around 618, but nevertheless, there's about a five-year discrepancy some, between some sources. But between 518, six, sorry, 618 and 622, uh, we have the Year of the Arabs beginning, which uh, the secular explanation for this is really, it was to do with the Battle of the Kar, the um, basically a sort of independence movement revolution amongst the Arabs um, uh, against the Persian Empire. And we have that Chinese source uh, as well, uh, the, uh, from the Jutang Shu, which talks about the um, origins of the, uh, the Arab state with this um, interesting story where some lion man gives uh, some armor, an armory to some um, camel herder um, in Persia. And uh, this story is what allows us to use Tabari, because this is an independent Chinese source about the origins of the Arab state. And it was recorded in the year 651. It was recorded in the year 651. So um, that's the, the, the interesting thing is that it was recorded in the year 651, the Jutang Shu. Although the Jutang Shu's records come much later, the fact is that that was a, a record which was copied down and first came to China in the year 651 from the, from the envoys of the Arab state. And they say that their state began with this strange story. I mean, at least the way it survived in Chinese uh, records is that there was a strange story, this, in, this lion man um, providing an armory for a camel herder in Persia. Um, now, lions are a symbol of imperial power, royal power even all around the world. So that can just be some royal guy um, gave an armory to some not so royal guy, a common guy, maybe he was a rich person where camel herders were rich, um, 
but he wasn't a nobleman. So a nobleman gave an armory to a, to a rich man in Persia. Now, as I said, this is what allows us to use Tabari because Tabari makes reference to this story. He makes reference to the, Lachmid, the last Lachmid king, Nutman, um, giving his armory to somebody called Hani ibn Kabisa. Hani ibn Kabisa. Okay, and uh, this leads to the Battle of the Kar, the battle where the Arabs gained their first independence from the Persians, which is around this time, the origin of the, the Arab calendar. So uh, what happens is that Hani ibn Kabisa inherits this armory from the last Lachmid king, and then uh, Khosrau, when he has the Lachmid king killed, he wants his, uh, his, um, his governor, Khosrau wants his, his governor in Hira to go and find out what happened to this armory and get it back. The governor in Hira, you know his name, Iyas ibn Kabisa. It's quite interesting that they're both called Ibn Kabisa, but they're on opposite sides. That's very interesting. Now, Iyas Ibn Kabisa in Tabari is not given a genealogy. They just call him Altai, which uh, could just be, if Tabari is using Aramaic sources or Persian sources, he could just simply be translating the Persian word Tazik into Arabic as Altai, or he could be translating the Aramaic word Tayaya into Arabic as Altai, and he's not giving uh, a genealogy for him. Now we know that this, these words, Tazig in Persian just means basically Arabs, and Tayaya in Aramaic just means basically Arabs. So they essentially it could have just said Iyas the Arab. Um, so Iyas ibn Kabisa the Arab, um, and that's being translated as Iyas ibn Kabisa Altai. Um, they don't give any more genealogy for him. And that's typical in Arabic sources when they have a bad guy, they don't like to give him any gene genealogy because they, it's like they're saying this is a guy who has no family history. He's not, he's, he's, he's like, he's, he's, they don't want to acknowledge his family. They don't want to insult his family by, by making reference to him as a bad guy. So they don't give a genealogy often for the bad guys. Meanwhile, Hani ibn Kabisa has a massive genealogy. It's huge. It goes on for, <laughs> name upon name upon name upon name. So Hani has a great genealogy, but Iyas doesn't. Iyas is the bad guy because he's the governor of, of Hira working for Khosrau, while Hani ibn Kabisa is the one who receives the armory from the Lachmid king. And when Iyas uh, write, uh, contacts or sends a message somehow to Hani saying, hand over the armory, Hani says no, and as a result, Hosrau decides upon war against Hani. The interesting thing is that Hani is the leader of a tribe of Arabs, a very powerful and important tribe of Arabs in the north, uh, and this is in, in Iraq, obviously, we're talking about in Iraq, and you'll never guess what the name of that tribe is. It's called the Bakr oh. tribe, the Bakr. So Hani is the leader of the Bakr. The leader of the Bakr. Now we have this, this, this title uh, where you have, the, for example, the, the leader of the Hanifs would be called Abu Hanifa. He's the leader of the Hanifians. Abu Hanifa, leader of the Hanifians. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that Abu Hanifa has a son called Hanifa. It's just a title meaning the leader of or the father of this group. Father of. It literally means father of. But when they don't have a son called Hanifa, which is plural anyway, we know that that's not the case. So the leader of the Bakr tree people can be called, legitimately, can be called the Abu Bakr, the father of the Bakr. So Hani ibn Kabisa would be the first known Abu Bakr, the first known father of the Bakrs. Um, and uh, so Hani, uh, Hani is uh, the leader of the Bakrs. He says, no, I'm not going to hand over the armory. And Hosra decides to go to war against him. And so they go to war, an advisor says to Hani, how about we use the armory which, which Numan, uh, the king, the king uh, al-Numan left for us, let's use that uh, armory to, um, uh, to, to, for our soldiers. So Hani agrees, they dress up the soldiers, but when Hani sees the, the, the power 
of the army coming for him, he panics and he, he, he gets cold feet. But he has two commanders, which he says one under his left hand and one under his right hand. And the one under his left hand, his name is Hanzala. Hanzala inspires the troops and gives them a lot of courage by reciting poetry for them. And uh, uh, they, they win the battle. Tabari says that they have a battle cry at this time. And the battle cry is Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. And this could have been inserted by the Abbasids. But it's, uh, it's worthwhile mentioning because we do have references from the 7th century King's Little J Jacob of Odessa to Muhammad, the hearing about the same time as this battle of the Iqar. At least the Arabs were united under a concept of Muhammad. Now, I will come to that later because there's no indication that this is a prophet or, uh, or uh, uh, anything to do with religion other than Christianity or at least Messianic Hebrew religion. And I'll explain that later. But for now, this Ya Muhammad could simply be a reference to uh, Jesus Christ. And it could be a reference to the uh, Messianic Hebrew religion of those people who were fighting against um, the, the, uh, um, uh, the Persians. Bear in mind, of course, this could simply be inserted because it's an Abbasid source we're talking about. And they could simply have inserted this into the battle because there is no reference to Muhammad in the battle. This is Islamic history and they had to they, they felt like they could they had to mention something so they put in the battle cry ya muhammad into that but apart from that battle cry there's no mention of religion or muhammad or anything like that but what we know is that hanzala becomes the next uh, leader um, after uh, hani so hani ibn kabisa very quickly is replaced by hanzala who becomes the next abu bakr and that is the origin of the independent Arab state, which we call Tajikistan. And I have a picture of Tajikistan, just to remind us what we're talking about when we're talking about Tajikistan. So there we have the uh, origin of the first independent Arab state in Mesopotamia. There it is. It's called Tajikistan. And that's the one that Sebios refers to. So the Arabs gained their independence from Persia at the Battle of the Iqar under the leadership of Hani ibn Kabisa, followed by Hanzala. They were both leaders of the Bakr tribe. Um, and that's the origins of the independent uh, Arab state, when we, which explains why we have a reference to a, an Arab king called Abu Bakr in a 7th century source, um, who doesn't last long. but. The thing is, which Abu Bakr? We don't know because any leader of the Bakr tribe could have been the Abu Bakr. It's not necessary to go to um, Islamic sources and say that there was a person called Abu Bakr who existed. Um, there were plenty of people called Abu Bakr <laughs> who could have existed. Anybody who was leading the, the Bakr tribe or perhaps even any leader of Tajikistan at that time could be called an Abu Bakr since the Bakr were the, 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 the leading Arab tribe which led the Arabs to independence from Persia. So this is nothing more than a title, is what you're saying? It's nothing more than a title for a king of the Bakr tribe, and this has got nothing to do with religion so far. That's what was happening in the East. Meanwhile, the Jews of, the, of, Pers of Jerusalem had been evicted and had gone to, uh, and sort of garrisoned themselves up in Edessa, which is up here. In southern and Turkey in southern Turkey. And um, then what happens is Hos, uh, uh, em Emperor Heraclius sets out on his campaign across Persia. Now, Bursariati goes into a lot of detail about how the Arabs started to gain uh, independence from Persia in a long series of battles at this time. Um, and she's the expert on that, so I'm not going to question her. Um, and it's got nothing to do with religion. But at the same time, Heraclius is, is campaigning across and he goes and he conquers uh, the Stesiphon. Um, uh, and and uh, with the, well, actually what happens is um, Hosrau's son, who is actually a, a monophysite Christian, um, has a, a, a revolution against um, um, Hosrau. Probably he has some support or some kind of uh, special groups, money, I don't know, some kind of support sent to him from Heraclius. And Heraclius has a revolution against um, Hosrau. Hosrau is overthrown. Ha Kavod, the son, the son of Hosrau is called Kavod. He establishes himself on the throne and, and immediately surrenders to Heraclius. 
So Heraclius, for a short time, becomes Shah on Shah, King of Kings uh, of the Persian and Byzantine Empire. But it's just for a matter of months. But he rules the entire Persian and Byzantine Empire. But he allows, um, he, he takes, he, he drops that title and he allows um, Kavod to be the ruler of Persia under certain terms of surrender. So well, can, we, yes. can we get dates here? What dates are we looking at right now? Hormis. Heraclius dates are what? First of all, Heraclius dates coming in and destroying or destroying Persia is what date? 628. So that's 628. So, uh, so here we go. There we have it, Tachkistan. Now, interestingly, what happens next in the same area, the, the next ruler we know of in that area of Tachkistan, who happens to be based in Nisibis, Nusaibin, which I've talked about with uh, Jay before in my previous videos, which is about here, where I'm pointing on the map right now, Nusaibin. The next ruler uh, of this area is called Hormiz VI, and he mints coins. He sets himself up as a rival Shah opposing the uh, Persian Shah, that's uh, Kavod and his successors, who are in uh, Stesiphon. So here we have a picture of Hormizd's uh, coin. This is Hormizd the sixth's coin. And he's based in, uh, in Nisbis. There's Nisbis here. Nis it says Nisibin, which is Nusaibin here. And here, this territorial area here is the outline of all of the different Bakr tribes. So the Bakr tribes were allegedly, according to um, the Abbasid sources, they were settled there later. Um, but we can hardly trust anything that's been through the Abbasid's hands unless there's an independent corroboration for it. And the independent corroboration we have at least is that uh, Tajikistan was the state of the Arabs. And this roughly is corresponding to the northern parts of Tajikistan. So this is the Wikipedia page of Hormuz VI. And uh, this is the coin they have up here of him. And the dates they have put down are 630 to 632. Wikipedia, you should never trust uh, exactly because uh, it's only a springboard to sort of, you, you start with Wikipedia and you go deeper. But since I don't have anything else to, um, to show about it uh, visually with me right now. I can only show these pictures and these dates from Wikipedia, but he's in the right place at the right time to be another Abu Bakr, another leader of the Bakr tribe, which I showed you the map of where he was just a few seconds ago. So, um, and he dies in 632. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> because 632 is the date that Muhammad died in uh, the standard Islamic narrative. And we, hear, we have a leader of the area of Tajikistan who died in 632. And then he would be succeeded by another Abu Bakr, who we don't know. That name is not given. But what we do know is that the standard Islamic narrative calls him As-Sadiq or uh, the Sadiq which also, of course, means the Sadducee. So that uh, Abu Bakr is the last of a series of Abu Bakr. So we had Hani ibn Kabisa, then we had Hanzala, then we had this Hormizd person, and then we have uh, the, an, a, a, a gap of uh, a, a gap from the year 632, we don't know until 634, we don't know, but that would be this, the years that the standard Islamic narrative give for their Abu Bakr, who is called the Sadiq, Sadducee. So then we have a Sadducee leader, and then that Sadasi leader is replaced by uh, the standard Islamic narrative says Omar.